بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وأقمنا الصلاة وآتينا الزكاة واطعنا الله ورسوله إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا First of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The period surrounding the emergence of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, is known as the period of Jahiliyyah. Jahiliyyah is normally translated in the English language with the term ignorance. Indeed, I think a better translation would be bashfulness or pride or arrogance. No doubt that that particular period was a period one would highlight to be a period of intense arrogance on the part of the Arabians towards the Prophet Muhammad and his message. Indeed, at the same time, it was a sense of pride in their own superstitious beliefs. Any community in the world may go through a period of ignorance, no doubt. When a human being is set on his ways, it's very difficult for you to come and tell them that the superstitious ways that they've now taken into their lives are ways of ignorance. Because no human being likes to be taken out of their bubble. We're all comfortable in our bubble. And if we have a set of practices that we've practiced for years, that our fathers have practiced for years, then it's very difficult for me to speak to you and to change you. Because as Amir al-Mu'mineen himself said, no one defeated me but the jahil. Yes, the jahil you cannot defeat. Because that jahil is so set in their ways that whoever comes and tells them that what you're doing is an act of pride, this act is going against the message of that which is ethical, of that which is moral, They'll reply to you by saying, if you try and fight us with ignorance, we'll reply back to you with an ignorance that will dwarf your ignorance. That was the poetry of the Arabs in Jahiliya. Abu Tamam himself has brought about so much poetry of the Jahili Arabs. And one of them was that when you told them that, listen, this period that you're in is a period of ignorance, you'd find many of them turning around and saying, that if you think that you can remove our ignorance, we'll destroy you with an ignorance that will dwarf your own ignorance. Such a type of people, it's very difficult to change. But of course, such a type of people did not only exist in Arabia. You can find them anywhere in the world where a human being, when they begin to have superstitious beliefs, come into their society and superstitious practices, anyone who comes and questions them will be attacked. Anyone who comes and belittles these practices, many people will attack them. They'll attack them because number one, they don't want the status quo changed. Number two, and this is the fundamental line, 
They don't want to go into a world of reflection and reason because the easier option is superstition and ideology. Yes? When the Prophet sent Ma'ad bin Jabal to the land of Yemen, he sent him and he said, Oh Ma'ad, tell the people of Yemen to leave their superstitious and ignorant ways and to come towards reflection and reason. If someone was to ask me what was the prophetic message, I would say two words. Reflection and reason. That's it. The prophetic message of the Holy Prophet, don't complicate it more than that. All it was doing, it was asking the Arabs that reflect on what you guys are doing. Yes, you are a group of people who have inherited the message of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. You've inherited a message of a great prophet. He built for you that Kaaba. He built it for you, not for you to bring superstition around the Kaaba. He built it for you so that you were able to remove yourself from the world of superstition and come to the world of reflection and reason. No doubt you find therefore that the Arabs, when the Prophet was growing up amongst them, sometimes people ask, why did you need Muhammad to rise? Yes, you could be patient and people will change. Good will come, bad will leave. Good will come, bad will leave. The Holy Prophet came at a point where the Arabs were on the point of being in the abyss of history. No one would remember them. If you look at the main Arab tribes of the time, let's say the Ba'idah, the Qahtaniya, and the Adnanis. The Ba'idah had already gone. They, nobody had remembered them. Their existence had finished. The Qahtanis were in Yemen. And the Adnanis, you had a few tribes from them like Bani Hashim. Nobody wanted to go towards these Arabs. The Greeks, when someone told them, why don't you conquer the Arab land? They're like, conquer what? We conquer a land where people drink muddy water and where people eat coarse food. Imam in Nahj al sets the scene for what was going on. In Sermon 26 of Nahj al Imam says, Allah chose the Prophet as a warner and as a trustee over his revelation. You Arabs were uh, situated in a place of the worst faith and the worst of possible places. You drank muddy water and you ate coarse food. You sat on the stony deserts and you would hear the deaf snakes next to you. You shed the blood of each other and separated your kith and your kin. You did not refrain from sin and you were worshipping the idols. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib describes Jahiliya, that period, in the best of ways, what did he say? He said the Prophet came as a warner and as a trustee to a group of people whose faith was the worst faith. They were in the worst place, drinking from muddy water, eating the worst of food, living in the most unhabitable region possible, and they were shedding blood of one another, separating kith and kin, and did not refrain from sinning. In other words, you look in the Quran, there's a wonderful line in the Quran in Surah 3 verse 103 where Allah tells the Arabs something interesting. He says, Kuntum ala shafa hufratin min an -nar minha. You were what? You were on the very pit or on the very edge of hellfire and my Prophet saved you from it. Yes? Literally on the very edge of hellfire. What does it mean on the very edge of hellfire? That that period, when some historians call it the period of ignorance, I call it the period of pure pride and arrogance. This is our way and no one's going to change it. Therefore, you find that that period of Jahiliya, fundamentally someone needs to examine why. Because whenever you're discussing how the Prophet Muhammad acted as a reformer, you can't discuss it until you show the context of what he was reforming. Today, if I want to talk about slave trade, or I want to talk about alcohol, or I want to talk about, for example, the rights of women in Islam, and say how the Prophet Muhammad reformed it, someone will ask me, well, how bad was it that he reformed it? If I don't know about the period of Jahiliya, I can never show how great the revolution was of the Prophet. And mind you, when we say revolution, revolution is normally defined as a political removal of authority. From one to another. In Arabic, the word for revolution is inqilab. Do you agree? Inqilab. But look at the root of inqilab. Qalb. You're not changing the political hierarchy. You're changing the hearts of that hierarchy. Yes. The word qalb is within the word inqilab. Every time I hear the word inqilab in a country's revolution, 
People are like, oh, there was a great inqilab, there was a great revolution. I'm like, inqilab of what? They're like, oh, that president fell and this new president came. I'm like, no. Inqilab, it's more important to change the hearts of the people than the presidents of that nation. I can now change the presidents of Egypt and Tunisia and Libya, but if the people's hearts haven't changed, then you're still going to get the same people in power all the time. The Holy Prophet, the reason you discuss where he emerges from, is any reformer can never be respected unless you understand where he's growing up in, the social milieu within his which Mandela, nobody would ever respect Mandela if they didn't know about apartheid. True? Who's going to respect Mandela? Muhammad Ali, who's going to respect him if nobody knew about racism in America in the 60s? No one's going to respect him. Likewise, you can never discuss the Holy Prophet without discussing the period of Jahiliyyah. Why? Because otherwise, his movement becomes like the movement of any reformer. They'll say, oh, we had a reformer in Mombasa 50 years ago. We had a reformer in Kenya 100 years ago. We had a reformer in Iraq 200 years ago. Everyone can bring a reformer. But a man who's able to change a group of people who are so stubborn in their ways, and really it brings you on to this introductory part on what is the role of a prophet within society. Yes? What's the role? Look at Ibrahim, look at Nuh, look at all of them. You'll always find the moment their people are steeped in superstition and are now in a world where they're just indoctrinated, the prophets come to try and bring reflection and reason. Nabi Ibrahim's people in idol worship, he has to emerge. Nabi Nuh's people, you know what they used to do? They used to slit the, uh, the, camel, the ears of a camel to say that this is a sacred camel. Make sure no one touches it. Tell me, who does that? You slit the ears of a camel to tell people this is sacred. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah 5, verse 103 discusses it. Nabi Nuh comes and says that now there's a time for reform. Likewise with the Prophet, when people were asking, what's the role of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family? When you say that the Prophet Muhammad is a Prophet of God, what's his role? What are you trying to state? You find that many have given a different opinion. Some said that he's both a philosopher and a man who prophesizes. The likes of Ibn Sina gave that opinion. Others like Farabi said, no, he makes metaphysical and ethical realities palatable to the masses. Yes, the masses don't understand the metaphysical and the ethical. So he's the one who makes it palpable to them. Others said he's a social reformer. Others said he's an ethical reformer, instills ethics in society. All of these have a certain truth to them, no doubt. At some times, he needs to explain to you the metaphysical. At other times, he needs to make you understand the future and the prophecies. But importantly, in the context of Jahiliyyah, he brings about social and ethical reform to a group of people who were on the edge. Now, someone might turn around to me and say, listen, all of us can be in a state of Jahiliyyah. Why would Prophet Muhammad come then and not now? It's a good question. And it's something that I'm going to come to shortly. But when I show you the Jahil of the Arabs that they were doing, you will actually think, you know what, how did you change such people? Yes. When Allah says they were on the pit of hell, on the edge of hell, and he just saved them, believe you me, tonight I'll show you examples of the very meaning of superstitious ignorance. And how the Holy Prophet had to change all of these superstitions to build a nation that within a hundred years has a base in India and a base in Granada. Truly a miracle how he does that. And I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Number one, were all the Arabs bad and ignorant when the Prophet emerges? Or did they have certain traits which he himself respected? Number two, what's the difference between basic ignorance and compound ignorance? And how dangerous was compound ignorance at the time? Number three, when we call the Arabs kafir, does kafir mean a person doesn't believe in Allah? Or does the word kafir have a similarity to the English term cover? Number four, what are the superstitious beliefs of the Arabs? And how was one of them that when you enter a village to remove all possible evil, you should make the noise of a donkey ten times? Number five, how does the Prophet seek to build on this? And how does he seek to reform it? In which way? Number six, how does the Quran show Jahiliyyah doesn't just come once. There's a second Jahiliyyah and a third and a fourth. And how may we be in a period of Jahiliyyah? And what does Ziyarat Ashura say about Jahiliya and its different forms and how it can never affect Aba Abdullah and his family? 
And what does it say about those who fought Ahlul Bayt? Were they the embodiment of Jahiliyyah on the earth? Let's try and examine this and seek to understand the topic in complete depth. Arabia cannot all have been bad because you can't have a society that's 100% bad. Yes. Likewise, you can never and will never have a society that's 100% good. The idea of a utopia is not real. Yes. Even when they say when the 12th Imam returns, people say that everything's going to be good, everyone's going to be good. No doubt, while the human being still has a nafs, that nafs is still attracted to sin. Shaitan may be out when the 12th returns. But the nafs of the human is still attracted to sin. So what does it mean that the 12th Imam will bring good? It means if three quarters of the world is bad and one quarter is good, he'll make three quarters good and there'll only be a quarter that's bad. There'll be a sudden turn. In Arabia, the majority were seen as being unethical. Or the majority were seen as being people who were steeped in super, superstitious ignorance. But that doesn't deny that there were people who were good. And that there were traits who were good. And that Rasulullah did not want to change all of their culture. What do I mean? Sometimes people imagine that when Rasulullah fought Jahiliyyah, it means that he wanted a 180 degree change. No. No prophet goes into a society wanting a 180 degree change. They go into a society wanting you to slowly move the angle, 45, 90, 135, and hopefully one day 180. When you come to Arabia, what do you see? You see the Arabs, when Rasulullah was born, no one was as generous as the Arabs. Hatam al is from who? Hatam al who I remember once I gave a lecture about Hatam al and someone said, oh, so that's Hatam al I said, how did you... Find out. He said, I saw a Bollywood film called Hatam al -Tai. He goes, and all this time I didn't know that this guy was living around or before the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Hatam al was known for his generosity. Yes, nobody was as generous as him. Even someone came to him one day and taught and asked him, is there anyone more generous than you, O Hatam? He said, I've met more generous than me. He said, I was on a long journey. I passed by a house, there was a lady in the house, I saw there was a small goat outside. He said, she looked at me, I looked at her. She said, please come, you look like you're on a journey, come as our guest. Hatam al and this was shortly before Rasulullah lived that he was born. He said that, I came to the lady, she said, come be our guest. Told her son, let's cook the meal for him. The son said, mom, let's go out, we'll get some wood and come back. She said, no, I can't bear to see him starve that much. Whatever small wood we have now, and now sacrifice that goat. Hatam al thought they had 100 goats, 200, 400 goats. How many goats did it turn out they had? Just the one. That one goat was theirs, but because he was a guest, the Arabs used to pride themselves on generosity. You know in the south of Iraq, if you go to Basra and Nasriya, you knock at someone's door, he'll let you in. For three days, he's not meant to ask you what you're doing there. On the fourth day, he'll say, so what are you doing here? <laughs> That can be pleasant, and that could be a nightmare as well, you know, because I could be sitting there thinking, well, if I ask this guy something now, he thinks I'm rude. If I stay here for three days, Baba, I need a, I've got a flight to catch. That's why many Iraqis beware before going to Basra and Nasriya, because you could get caught in one of the tribals, and the way that they deal with their beautiful generosity. Rasulullah likewise saw that the Arabs had this. Hatam al was the embodiment of generosity. Was he in the world of Jahiliya? Yes, the environment was Jahil. But a man at the end of the day, however much you live in the jungle, you still can be a great human being. Yes, it's up to you how you make the world. Either you make the world and submit to it, or you let the world submit to your feet. Yes. And you are able to judge your environment. And that's Hatam al son, Adi, Adi ibn Hatam. What a companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. How sometimes a father may be someone who's a Christian, but because he's a good human being, Allah blesses him with a son who loved Ali ibn Abi Talib. Shia of Ali to the core. Yes. Adi ibn Hatam, Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, Uwais al Qarani, Malik al Ashtar. These types, these are the core. They are the lovers of Ali who fought alongside him and he lost an eye next to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in battle. Yes. You found therefore their generosity. Number two, their bravery, their chivalry. Number three, at the same time, there were four months of the year where they said there would be no war. 
These months we call them in the Quran Al Ashhar Al Haram. Yes, Muharram, Rajab, the Qa'dah, the Hijjah. Four months the Arabs wouldn't fight, and I'm sure you recognize the irony of the first of those months. You find that those four months, Muharram, Rajab, the Qa'dah, the Hijjah, the Arabs wouldn't fight. Rasulullah is a prophet of God. He's got every right to abolish this. Why? Why should you abolish? It's a good thing. Inshallah, 12 months there's no war. Yes. But four months is a good start. Muharram, Rajab, the Qa'dah. And the Hijjah, that was another area of their plus. Some exaggerate their greatness. Some say the Arabs were really civilized. Why? In the, sometimes in the mindset of some academics, civilized means three things. That you have buildings, that you have trade, and you have language. But to me, that doesn't really indicate civilization. Okay, the Arabs had Arabic. But Arabic is a mixture of Aramaic and Hebrew and Syriac. Yes. They're independent. You can have languages that mix. In terms of buildings, there were certainly no buildings in Mecca. The buildings were towards Yemen, the Ma'rab area. In terms of trade, the Arabs, yeah, they were part of a trade route, but nothing more. In Africa, there are certain colonies which are trading, but they're still under the leadership of bigger countries, yes? Arabs did not have their own power because of trade or language or so on. And civilization is not about your trade and your buildings. Wallah, there are countries in the world today. They have the best buildings, skyscraper, mashallah, yes? And they trade in the best phones and laptops. And at a restaurant, he'll open the brain of a monkey and eat from it. Yes? He takes the monkey, it's a delicacy. And the monkey on the table, and you uh, boil the brain of the monkey while the monkey's alive. And I'm meant to be the inhuman one, yes? And that person has got trade, that person has got buildings, but civilization is not trade and buildings. Civilization is when the souls are purified, when the heart is open, when the heart is pure as well. Rasulullah saw that these people have many good traits, and at the same time, he didn't want to change all their culture. You know how some Arabs would say, Salamu alaikum? I remember Rasulullah was talking to Urwa bin Mas'ud al Thaqafi. While Rasulullah was talking with him, Urwa came, said salam by pulling the beard of Rasulullah. Imagine, imagine today, you know, we, many of us don't have to worry. We've got cute beards. But imagine you were part of a mosque where you were long bearded, let's say. And every time someone comes to say salamu alaikum to you, it's like salamu alaikum. Yes. Eventually the person's going to say, excuse me, buddy, what are you doing? Yeah. When Urwa done that to Rasulullah, Mughira bin Shu'ba was Urwa bin Mas'ud al thaqafis nephew. He said to him, how dare you pull the beard of Rasulullah in that way? Mughira turned around. He said to him, is that Urwa? He said, is that, uh, Urwa turned around. He said, that Mughira? He said, yes. He said, you're teaching me about how to behave with Muhammad. Rasulullah turned around to Mughira. He said, no, no. He said, if Banu Thaqif's method of saying salam to me is by pulling the beard, I've not come to change their culture. There's nothing wrong with that. Culture has a place in religion. As long as culture doesn't go outside Sharia. There's no harm. Listen, you have your cooking, I have mine. You want to cook your dishes, cook yours. I cook my dishes as well, there's no harm. All of us can cook our dishes. But as long as we're not going outside Sharia, in the way we cook, the way we interact, there's no harm. So Rasulullah, those who imagine, he came to the Arabs and he said to all of them, you people are all away, you people are all bad. You... No, 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 Rasulullah said, you have the goodness of what? You respect honesty. You respect truthfulness. Why do you think they respected him as Sadiq and Amin later on? Also, you are people who have generosity. The one few areas you want to change are areas which, believe you me, superstition has overtaken you. Why? In Islam, we divide jahl into two. All of us in this hall may have one of these two forms of jahl. One form of jahl is jahl basit. A second is Jahal Murakkab. Anyone who studied logic or mantiq at the Islamic seminaries will know logic divides ignorance in certain sections into two. Ignorance which is basic and ignorance which is compound. What's basic ignorance? I, for example, am someone who's not very good in technology. I have a basic ignorance of technology. Therefore, I have Jahal which is basit. I will come to someone and say, listen, I'm not good with iPhone 6. I'm not good with my MacBook. Can you teach me? 
I don't just have basic ignorance, but I'm willing to admit I am ignorant. Yes. I'm willing to say to someone, listen, I know that I'm ignorant and I'm not proud of my ignorance. And I'm ready that if you're more learned than me on the world of the iPhone and the MacBook and so on, then I want you to teach it to me. All of us have that type of ignorance. Some of us are not good at geography. Some aren't good at history. Some aren't good in the sciences. We all have a certain amount of basic ignorance. Jehel Basit. The more dangerous ignorance was the one affecting Arabia. Jahal Murakkab. Jahal Murakkab is compound ignorance. When you're not willing to admit that you have flaws in your culture or that you have flaws in your way of life. Anyone who comes and tells you, Baba, isn't it time to change? Isn't it time to get closer to Allah? You're like, no, I'm not ready and you can't change me. Yes, this is the way it is. Isn't it time to read more Quran? Learn about it a little bit? No. I will do it when I feel like it. That person is the most dangerous person in society. Why? Ali ibn Abi Talib divides people into four. There are those who know and know that they know. There are those who know but don't know that they know. There are those who don't know and know that they don't know. And there are those who don't know and don't know that they don't know. Yes. Ali ibn Abi Talib's mind is not for Muslims. If Ali ibn Abi Talib had gone to other religions, it would have been better. Muslims place him as four. First type of person with jahl. First type of person is what? There are those who know and know that they know. There are those who know, but don't know that they know. They're very humble. They actually know more than they do. Yes. Many of you should be madrasa teachers. But when you ask someone young to be a madrasa teacher, it's like, but I don't know much. You do know much. Go and teach. Stop being lazy. Third is what? Third group of people are those who don't know and they know that they don't know. Listen, I put my hand up. I don't know and I know that I don't know. Yes? The fourth. Allahu Akbar if you meet the fourth. There are those who don't know and don't know that they don't know. Ali ibn Talib. He says there are those who don't know and they don't know that they don't know. That person, he doesn't know a thing. And he walks around like a peacock in the mosque. Enter, you can't even name for me the first 10 surahs of the Quran. And you're complaining about jama'at and how jama'at should be run. Go and learn the names of the first 10 surahs of the Quran. No, 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 five. Just five. Up to Ma'ida, I will give you an award. You are a good human being. Yes? There are those who don't know. And they don't know that they don't know. Arabia had people who don't know. And they didn't know that they didn't know. Yes? In many cases... They would walk around saying, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm actually a good man. I am a person who doesn't need to change. There were others in Arabia who had basic jahl. They were the ones who converted as soon as they heard Islam. Straight away. Your Abu Dhar's, your Bilal's, your Ammar bin Yasir's. The moment they heard what is the area they're ignorant of, they said, this is what we've been looking for. Yes? Then there are others. No. Your Abu Sufyan's, your Walid ibn al Mughira's, your Utba ibn Rabi'ah's, people like that, they don't know and they don't know that they don't know. That's it. And then there were those who don't know and knew that they didn't know and didn't want to change. You can have that person. He doesn't know and he knows that he doesn't know, but he'll be like, I can't be bothered doing anything about it. You're like, but you don't know. Don't you want to improve? No. But you know you don't know. Still, this is the way I am. When Rasulullah came, this was the people I had to deal with. Therefore, what were they called? Some called them jahil. Later, they would call them kafir. Someone says kafir means someone who doesn't believe in God. You've missed the point on kafir. Wallah, I remember someone, he converted to Islam. We were sitting in a kaf in London. He converted to Islam. We were sitting in this kaf and we're all chilling there. And someone told him, listen, this guy over here, he's a sheikh. Yes. And I don't want at that time that I'm chilling for the question and answer to begin. Listen, I'm here to chill. Give me a bit of time to chill. Anyway, the person came to me. Salam alaikum, Shaykh. MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. You know, he started talking to me. He said to me, Shaykh, you know what? I'm looking for this person. Wallah, if I find them, I'm going to kill them. So I'm like, what do you mean? He said, there's this person. Wallah, if I find them, I'm going to kill them. I'm like, who? He's like, his name's Kufr. In every lecture, they say he's bad. I'm like, bro, kufr is not a person. Kufr is a state of mind. There are some, that person actually imagined that kufr was a guy because in every lecture, 
He hears the cause of all trouble in Islam is kufr. Kufr is not a guy. Kufr is a state of mind. When we call someone kafir, I hear many people saying, they're kafir, they're kafir. Do you know what kafir means? Kafir is not the one who doesn't believe in Allah. Islam, when it said kafir in English, kafir, the root is cover. Look at the similarity. Kafir, cover. When you are covering what? Your fitra from developing. When there's a stagnation in your thought, you've decided if mommy did it, I do it. Daddy did it this way. Granddad did it this way. Granddad did it this way. We do it the same way. Someone says, but Baba, granddad's time and your time is different. And who told you everything granddad's saying is correct? No. This is the way my granddad done it. And that's the way it should be. That is what kufr is. A stagnation in the reflection of the thought of the human where they end up covering their primordial nature from emerging. Yes. That's the meaning of kufr. When Rasulullah came to Arabia, the kafir is not someone who doesn't believe in Allah. You, what, do you think Allah needs us to believe in him? Allah wants us to reflect and not stagnate. He wants a constant reflection. Why do you think Rasulullah, one of his first hadiths was, an hour of reflection is greater than 70 years of dry worship. Stop worshipping. Wallah, in the mosque I see people reading dua, 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 dua. What did you understand of that dua now that you're leaving to go home? What do you understand? Dua Kumail and dua Tawbah and dua Makaram and Akhlaq. What did you understand? Robot. And mashaAllah, the parents are proud. Our kids were reading dua and now we've gone home. Sit in Majlis Aba Abdullah. I'll teach them a million times more than they'll learn in dua. You find that there are certain people here who've got that ignorant mind frame. Stagnation of thought, no reflection. It's all ritual, ritual. Laylatul Qadr, put a Quran on the head. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Muhammad, Ya Ali. Don't worry about putting a Quran on your head on Laylatul Qadr. Do it for the rest of the year. Yes, not just in Laylatul Qadr. Pick up the Quran the rest of the year. Arabia was the same. Stagnation in thought. It's just ritual and superstition. Ritual and superstition. When Rasulullah came, he wanted that change. That angered them. That was the thing that hurt them. The disdain that you're changing me from my father's beliefs. How dare you? What do you think now when I say that there is more importance in a lecture than there is in reciting dua? Someone says, but you know what? Dua is, no one denied dua is important. Sit in a lecture is a hundred times more important. Yes? The knowledge you'll get in a one hour lecture is 95,000 times more than you will in a dua you'll read without understanding. So then what happens here? Rasulullah comes, the first area that they have a problem, first area of superstition is what? Is that they worship these idols. Wallah, the way they respected their idols is phenomenal. Ibrahim broke them. Muhammad didn't break. He sat back and wanted to talk with them. Yes? When they had these idols, firstly, an idol for every day of the year. How many days was there in the Arabian calendar? 360 days of the year. There was an idol for every day. The more respectable families would have the keys to the temple of the idols. Yes? These idols, what was their role? Number one, istikhara. Because you know, idol is good at istikhara. Istikhara, yes. They would go by an idol. They put papers by their idols. They had three types of idols. In the Quran, you'll see the word ansab. And Awthan and Asnam. And Ansabu were they? They were small, small stones that they would make into an idol. Arabs, they take four stones with them when they're going on a journey. Then on their way, they'll look at the stones and they'll be like, mm, which one shall I use? Um, uh, uh, this one, okay. That's my God for the journey in the pocket. And the other three, you put for fire, so you cook something. So God obviously dies at the end. Now, the Arab used to need to take an istikhara. You need to take istikhara. I need to take istikhara. So the Arab needs to take istikhara because Mawlana Idol is known for his great istikhara. The Arab would come, he'd put a, like a, a stick or a piece of paper by the idol. Yes. And on one paper it says, do. Uh, the other paper says, do not. So what, do you, what ends up happening? What ends up happening is, that you put your hand out and then it says do not so the idol has said to you do not do this act yes 
So they used the idol for istikhara. Idol would get hungry, so they would take saffron. You know, Iranians love saffron on their rice, yes? Idols as well love saffron. So they would put saffron for the idols. The Quran says that Allah gives the example of the fly. Because you know what, what made the Arabs angry about flies? Every time you put saffron on their idols, the fly comes and takes the idol. It takes the stuff for them. Because flies love saffron. And the flies would come and the Arabs would go, come here, come here, come here. And the Quran says, if you put partners to Allah, tell them to create a fly. Forget creating. Let them catch a fly if they can. <laughs> you see in Mombasa when you try and catch a mosquito? Multi-millionaire trying to catch a mosquito, he can't. And the atheist says, I'm the most powerful. So you have then, you give saffron. Idol gets thirsty. So what do you give someone thirsty? Milk. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari says, the moment I saw the milk next to an idol, I became Muslim. I said to him, how? He said, my tribe, Bani Ghafar, used to go and put a glass of milk next to the idol. So when they put the glass of milk next to the idol, I used to go and watch. I'm like thinking, and you know, Abu Dhar never worshipped an idol in his life. His tribe did. He never. He was always a believer, but he was looking for Rasulullah. Abu Dhar says, I saw them put the milk near the idol. Mm, let's see what happens. Who gets past the idol at that time? Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox is a cunning guy. Yes. Fox comes towards the milk. He sees no one's looking, no one's looking, drinks all of the milk. Now, Mr. Fox, when he's had a lot to drink, what does he need to do? Mr. Fox turns around, yes, and he urinates on the idol. Abu Dhar turned around. He said, if my God could not protect itself from the urine of an idol, how is it going to protect Abu Dhar al-Ghafari? <laughs> so then you had that. Then you had some who would make an idol from dates. Yes, you collect dates, you make an idol. Umar ibn Khattab says, we used to worship a God made from dates. But the biggest problem that we faced was every time we got near that God, one of us took a date and would eat it. A second would take a date and would eat it. By the end, God has, mashallah, died. Yes? So you had all these idols. They were all there. If they wanted to, you, as I said, there are three forms of idols. So the first one was the one you get four stones and one of them becomes an idol. Second one was you'd make an idol, you'd paint an idol and you'd put it there. The third one, which we all call the Asnam, they are idols made from gold or silver. Yes, so there's three types. Then they take from the, you know, they believed in Allah. The, the Arabs of Jahiliyyah all believed in Allah. If Quran says, if you ask them, who is your Lord? They would say Allah. So how are they worship idols? They say Allah is the highest God, then after him the idols. Yeah. The idols are manifestation of attributes. So they would take from Allah's name. For example, Allah's name is what? Allah, they would make an idol called Allah. Or if Allah's name was Aziz, they would make an idol called Uzza. Yes. So they, then if they're about to go on a journey, they go and sacrifice, uh, let's say a sheep by the Kaaba. They take the blood and they pour it all over the poor idol's face. <laughs> because then the idol will give them goodwill for their journey. Then they started putting limbs because they said God must have hands and feet. So then they made an idol with limbs. And they would all come and bow before it. Rasulullah would come, he'd sit with them. Well, these idols neither harm you, they don't benefit you. And the main area for him wasn't that you were worshipping idols. It was the stagnation in your thought. Rasulullah wanted that there would be no stagnation in thought, that any society would reflect on its superstitions. That was the superstitions for idols. What were the other superstitions? Listen to these. A second superstition they had, if there was a solar eclipse of the sun, that meant that a child had died. So whenever there's a solar eclipse, a child has died. So when Rasulullah lost his son, many of them saw a solar eclipse, they said that means that every time there's a solar eclipse, that there's been a child who's died. Rasulullah said the sun and the moon, are creations of Allah. It has nothing to do with children dying. That was the second. The third was what? The third was the world of camels. The main vehicle for the Arab in Jahiliyyah was a camel. And the main area of their jahal was camels. Someone says, how? An Arab, when it came to camels, you know what they would do? For example, if they took a camel, someone famous in their society died. The person's dead. They've done the janazah. They buried him. They bring a camel and they tie the camel to the grave until the camel dies of thirst. 
Why? Because so when this person becomes alive again on a day where they are raised, let's say, then they will have a camel where they can ride on. Yani, there's no other camels available, just that one. So that third, what else would they do? For example, if they were angry with a certain event, they'd cut the feet of the camel in a way that would cause pain to the camel. Then you had, for example, with the cow and the ox. When it wouldn't rain in Arabia, do you know what the Arabs would do? They'd go to the, these two trees, the sal tree and the usha tree. They'd take two uh, branches and they'd burn the tail of a cow. They'd put the cow on fire. The cow would be screaming on fire and they'd think that this is a way to tell the gods send us down rain. We are sacrificing a cow for you. They'd literally burn a cow. If they took a cow and they took an ox to drink water and the ox drank but the cow didn't, they would beat the ox to death. How could you drink more than the cow drank? Imagine you come to deal with these people. That tells you what a miracle it was to even change them a little. Let's see Arabia's hospitals and jahiliya. If you had rabies, yes, a dog bit you in Arabia. You know what? How do you cure rabies? You go to the chief of the jahils of the time, he gives you some blood, you get his blood and you put it on the rabies and mashallah the rabies will go. As many realized, they ended up going. Then a dentist in Arabia, mashallah there weren't many dentists, but what was the best way to cure a toothache? Get the teeth of a fox and make it a necklace and put it on. If not, if you were ill, make sure you get a gold necklace, not a copper one because copper when you're ill will not cure you. But if you get a gold necklace, that will cure you. If your illness got worse, then you get a necklace, you put some camel meat in it with wheat, with barley, you go to a hole in a mountain and you sit there until you recover. Many people ended up dying in that hole. So you had all of these things happening at the time. The solar eclipse, rain, beating a camel, burning a cow, the hygiene, all of these things. And then you had the worst of the worst, which would be... That when they go on a holiday, they're about to enter a village, all of them look at each other. And at that moment when they're all looking at each other, what do they do? They tell each other, let's make ten noises of a donkey. And the Quran says the worst noise is that of a donkey. Yes. You find that these people would come, and by the way, at this stage, I put myself officially saying that I'm originally Turkish. Yes. Nothing to do with these guys. Later on, when the Imams come, I'm Arab again. But for the time being, I'm back to being Turkish. So, you have all of these superstitions. Rasulullah, when he comes, he tells them that these superstitions that you have must go. Some of them, straight away, when they hear Rasulullah tell them to leave the world of Jahl, some of them, they change straight away. Others of them, no. This is the way of our forefathers. is repeated so much in the Quran. This was a lesson to all of us in the community as well today. That when you have certain practices, ask where the practice has come from. Don't just do something because dad and mom and granddad and everyone done it. We may have some practices in our beliefs which are what Ahl al-Bayt taught us. We may have other practices which we've taken from other religions and they've come into our culture. Don't just do a practice on the basis that the family or the ancestry has practiced that practice. When some of the jahils would come to Rasulullah, and they would speak to him. Sometimes Rasulullah would get hurt about how rude they'd be with him. Who do you think you are telling us about our camels? He said, no. I am here not just to reform the rights of the human, but the rights of the animal world as well. Yes. And it hurts me every time I go to a country which claims to represent Rasulullah. When I see the way animals are treated, I say, Ya Rasulullah, come and look at your Muslims today with animals. The way we treat cats, the way we treat dogs, the way we treat other animals in our countries is abysmal. Rasulullah came to them, he said, the camel is a sign of Allah, number one. Number two, the camel, you never continue a conversation while you're sitting on your camel. You get off, you talk to the human, and then you go back and sit on the camel because that camel doesn't deserve a burden while you're having pleasure. Number three, you never leave a camel in thirst. Number four, not just you don't leave a camel in thirst, never strike a camel on his face. Yes. 
Number five, never burden a camel that it goes a distance which is too much for it. In the same way you require rest, it requires rest. Look at the animal rights of Rasulullah. He's telling them that you people are slitting the ears of a camel. You people are burning camels, cutting the feet of the camels. These are signs of Allah as much as the human is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When some of them would come and talk arrogantly to him, Quran taught him the way you talk to any jahil when he speaks to you. When a jahil talks to you, in our community, if a jahil comes and talks to you, what do you say? إِذَا خَاطَبَهُمْ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سلاما. When a jahil speaks to you, you know what you say to them? Speak to my hand, not me. Meaning, Quran says, when a jahil talks to you, say peace. A jahil you will never defeat, never. Rasulullah did not force them to change. He just said to them, my principles are that you treat the animal properly, treat the orphans properly, treat your elderly properly, treat the physically challenged properly, help bring kith and kin together, stay away from idol worship, reflect, reason, have introspection in you. That's the message of the religion of Islam. And believe you me, that jahiliyyah, do you think it went straight away? In Surah 48 verse 26, a couple of years before Rasulullah died, you find that that jahiliyyah hasn't gone away. Because in the Quran, Allah says in this, in this ayah, Surah 33 verse 33, He talks to the wives of Rasulullah. وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرَّجِ الْجَاهِلِيَةَ الْأُولَى Tells the wives of Rasulullah that you also can be affected by jahiliyyah. Yes? A wife of Muhammad is not someone who is in ma'soom. Yeah, she can be affected by jahiliyyah. Quran says to the wives of Rasulullah, stay in your houses and do not display like you used to in the days of ignorance. Yes. In the days of what? The first ignorance. Imam, fifth Imam was asked, why is it written, jahiliyyah al-ula, the first jahiliyyah? I thought there was only one jahiliyyah. Why first jahiliyyah? Imam al-Baqir replied, because there's a second jahiliyyah, and a third jahiliyyah, and a fourth jahiliyyah. There are many jahiliyyahs, yes. In Rasulullah's time, people were worshipping idols. Today you have a show called Pop Idol. In Rasulullah's time, and we'll come to it inshallah in the forthcoming lectures, they were burying children alive. Today there are countries which put a limit on children, otherwise abortion straight away and forget the child. Some even eat the fetus. In Rasulullah's time, you had a jahiliyyah. That jahiliyyah doesn't stop. Every generation, there will be certain jahili practices. And that continued in Mecca even at the end of Islam. In Surah 48 verse 26. What? Al-hamiyyata. Hamiyyata al-jahiliyyah. You will find in those who disbelieve the disdain against your message. The disdain of jahiliyyah, yes? When the Quran says, إِذْ جَعَلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْحَمِيَّةَ حَمِيَّةَ الْجَاهِلِيَةَ حَمِيَّةَ الْجَاهِلِيَةَ means what? Means that even though Islam came, there were still the traces of jahl in some of these new Muslims. Yes? Still the traces of jahl in the new Muslims, meaning what? Meaning that jahl was not completely wiped out. Rasulullah managed to bring Arabia away when you were able to civilize these Arabs. And make them respect and love each other. That was a long way. But still the warning was given to, my, to the wives of Rasulullah. Let not jahili affect you. And then later the ayah said, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّتْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَاهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Yes? Let's have a second louder salawat please. A third in honor of Imam Sahib al-Asri was Zaman. You find therefore the ayah begun talking about the wives, saying jahiliyyah could affect the wives. But then the ayah said, but there's a group who I have purified where jahiliyyah will never touch them. If it, this whole ayah of tathir was about the wives of Rasulullah, then what? It wouldn't make sense that you warn them about jahiliyyah, then you say that I've purified them. The ayah begins in the feminine and then moves to the masculine. In the masculine, we know females are included in Arabic grammar. So in Hadith al-Kisa, you see, in the Sahih books, like for example, Sahih Muslim, 
It says, Hadith al-Kisa, Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein were under the Kisa. And Allah revealed the ayah. Allah wants to keep away from you all jahiliyyah, all najasa, all rich. He wants to keep it away, not to remove it from you. I read one Quran translated. Allah wants to remove impurity from Ahl al-Bayt. When you remove something, that means it was already there. Do you agree? Clever Quran translator. You'll have your day, but it won't last long. Quran translation should be, Allah wants to keep away all impurity. Al-Muhammad, Jahiliya and its najasa does not touch them. The wives of Rasulullah, yes, Jahiliya can affect. Nabi Nuh's wife, Jahiliya affected her, she became kafir. Do you agree? Surah 66 verse 10. Nabi Lut's wife, Jahiliya affected her, she became kafir. Surah 66 verse 10. Rasulullah, his wives, can they be affected by Jahiliya? Yes. Why not? Any wife of Rasulullah can be affected by Jahiliya. Nuh and Lot's wife died kuffar. And likewise, anyone can die if they allow Jahiliya to affect them. Who does Jahiliya not affect? Lam tunajiska al-jahiliya bi wa lam tulbiska min mudlahim mati Subhanallah. That line. That Aba Abdullah Hashadu and Naka Kunta Nuran, Phil Asla Bisha Micha, Wal Arham Al Mutahara, Lem forever to Najiska, the Najasa of Jahiliya. Jahiliya is a state of mind. Someone says, How could it be Najis? The impurities of stagnation in thought can affect anyone. It cannot affect Al Muhammad. Yes. Lem to Najiska Al Jahiliya, Bian Jasia. وَلَمْ تُلْبِسْكَ مِنْ مُدْلَهِمْ مَاتِ ثِيَابِهَا What does that mean? That means here yeah, that Jahiliya will never affect Al-Muhammad. That also means that whoever fights Al-Muhammad is the embodiment of Jahal. Do you agree? Anyone who fights Al-Muhammad is a Jahil. Is a Jahil walking on the earth. If you fight Imam al-Sadiq, you're a Jahil. Do you agree? You fight Imam al rada you're a jahil. Do you agree? Likewise, if you end up fighting Ashab al kisa you're a jahil. That verse I quoted earlier, Kuntum ala shafa hufratin min al nahr minha. That verse which says that you Arabs were on the edge of hell and Rasulullah saved you. Do you know who quoted that ayah just before she died? Fatima al Zahra. Just before she died. In her famous khutbah, the khutbah about the land of Fadak that was taken from her. Yes. Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih says, Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr. Clear hadith. If you want to go and search it, anyone can go and search it. And we shouldn't be scared of discussing our history. Yes, I don't mind. A person wants to respect a person who angers Fatima, that's between him and Allah. I'm not going to judge that person. Bukhari narrates Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr. And if you want to type the name Fedak in Google, Sahih al-Bukhari, the whole hadith comes up. Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr, did not want him at her funeral. And she wanted to be buried secretly in the middle of the night. No Muslim in the world can tell you where Fatima is buried. There are people who gave nothing to Islam, who have a dharih on top of their grave. And the daughter of Rasulullah has a stone, has nothing on top of her, no one to protect her, no one to honor her. Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr. If Fatima is one of the women of Jannah, then whoever angers her, what are they? That's a person has to decide in their life. What are they? When she gave the khutbah, she said, you people were on the edge of hell. And my father saved you according to the Quran. And now you treat me and my husband like this. The wasi of Rasulullah, the Imam of Allah, chosen on the day of Ghadir. And on top of that, not only treat her in this way, but slap her behind the door. <laughs> not just slap her behind the door, force the nail through the rib of the daughter of Rasulullah. Do you not realize that that nail didn't go in the rib of Fatima? It was the rib of Muhammad, really, it was in. 
because Fatima bad'atun minni man adaha faqad adani Fatima is a part of me whoever angers her angers me oh ya Zahra when will these eyes see your qabr one day yes ya Zahra your daughter Zainab I want to see her qabr at least four years I haven't been back to her grave and I want to see your grave as well in Medina. Behind the door, a nail into the rib of Fatima, yes? Behind the door, a slap on the cheek of Fatima, yes? And that's what broke the heart of Amir al Mu'mineen, Asma bint Umayyis narrates. She said, When I was washing the body of the Fatima al Zahra with Amir al Mu'mineen, she said all of a sudden he left the body and went and sat in the corner of the room. I turned round to him and I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib, victorious of Khaybar and Khandaq, in the corner of the room crying incessantly. I said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you are the victorious at Khandaq and Khaybar. I see you in a way I've never seen you before. He said to me, Asma, don't blame me. As I was washing the body of Fatima, my hand went across the rib of Zahra. <laughs> my hand went across the rib of Zahra. I felt the rib of the daughter of Rasulullah. <laughs> Then after that, when they carried the janazah, Abu Dhar said, I saw Ali carrying the janazah. I was carrying the janazah as well. He said, all of a sudden, I saw Imam Al-Hassan and Imam al Hussein run to the body of their mother, father. He said, when I saw them come near the body, I saw Hussein on the chest of his mother. The moment I saw him on the chest of his mother, I saw Imam Amir al Mu'mineen remove Hussein from the chest of his mom. I said to him, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, why did you remove Hussein from the chest of his mom? He looked at me and he said, Oh Abadar, Jibrail came to me. He said to me, remove Hussein from the chest of his mom. I said to him, why? He said, the angels cannot bear to see Abba Abdullah crying on the chest of his mother. I asked the angels, if you couldn't bear to see Hussein on the chest of his mom, how did you bear to see Shimmer on the chest of Abba Abdullah? إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلم ينقلبون. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asr wal Zaman. Unite the Ummah on the love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. يا الله if any of us are in a state of jahiliyyah, remove that state from us. Allow us to reflect and reason in our lives. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala. For all of our Muslim brethren around the world, especially our brothers in the Sayyidah Zainab area, a bomb just took place there, just now. We received the news just before I came to the lecture, two bombs by the shrine of Sayyidah Zainab. Ya Allah, protect the shrine of Zainab and allow our eyes to see the grave of Fatima, mother of Sayyidah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat.